keep singing and I can go back to sit down if that's okay with everybody because that was that was a blessing so um gentlemen do I need to are we good cool hey good morning I'm Dan one of the pastors here uh does everybody have their tissue box my wife had to grab one for me um I warned you last week that today was going to be a doozy um today we come to this place in our study of the book of 1 Peter where we are dealing with the wounds that we have from this life. Hurts um, in our life. What, what is interesting about church life, because it tends to be the place where I hang out the most, um, when we come to church on a Sunday morning and you look around the lobby or the sanctuary and people are coming in or going out, you know, as people do on a Sunday morning, we look at the outside appearance and everything seems to be pretty good. You know, everyone that's here has showered sometime in the last three to four weeks, right? Um, their clothes are kind of clean. They're sort of put together. It doesn't look like anything was a complete accident. So you look at them and you start to think well, everything's okay. And the assumption is that because on the outside everything looks good, then the inside must be the same. And the danger, church, is this, that I know and that you know and God knows that everyone that has come in here today looking good, which you all are, I can look at every one of you right now, you're all looking pretty good. When, when we come in here and we, if we come in with that, that heart, the danger is this, then we might start to think that it's not okay to not be okay. You know, you might start to think, well, I don't, I don't really fit in here. Everyone is just like, hey, how you doing? I'm good. Well, you're good? I'm good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm blessed. Everybody heard that one? Or, I'm fine, brother. How are you? And I know that on the outside, I might look good, but on the inside, I'm a complete train wreck. And then you start to believe that, that you can't be real with your wounds. And the reality is this church, everyone has hurts in their life. Everyone has struggles in their life. Everyone has those things or those wounds but it isn't like an external wound, like when you're a kid and you fall off your bike, right, and you get a scratch or a cut. You might get a scar, but it heals, and it heals relatively quickly. You know, I would say a lot of us probably have scars on our body. We don't even know where they came from, right? Was it when I was getting in a knife fight in the kitchen cutting the carrots? Or was it from that one time I went to go pick up a student from their house and their yellow lab snapped at me and bit me? I was just trying to take the kid to coffee and talk about Jesus, but... Or was it from last year when I got my gallbladder removed? I don't even know. No clue. Because the, the outside pains and the outside scrapes and hurts, they heal relatively fast, right? But external wounds, even though they leave a scar that can be seen, are different from internal wounds. Wounds from life, on the other hand, can't be seen. They're easily hidden. Internal wounds heal very slowly and are reopened easily. Many times, something that's happened 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago are still being relived in our lives and in our brains today. You know, someone was offended back when George Washington was the president, and they're still being offended of it because of it today. So how do you overcome that? How do you navigate through those wounds that you experience in life? In church, that's why 100% I believe that all scriptures God breathed. That it's profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and training in righteousness so that the people of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. And I don't know about you, but I know about me. And I'm in need of some teaching reproof, correction, and training in righteousness when it comes to this area. I've carried around inner hurt from things that have happened in my life. 
and I bet you have too. So I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that I don't have to have all the answers because the wounds this life deliver are really, really hard. And if you're walking through some of those wounds right now, just know we love you. We're here for you. And I pray that this message will speak directly to you, most of all. So here we go, First Peter chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. If you want to stand as I read, you are more than welcome to stand with me in honor of God's word. If not, it's totally okay. I will not think any less of you. This is what First Peter says, chapter 4. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles would do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead, for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled, sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything, God may be glorified through Christ Jesus. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father God, we are so thankful for this time and this place that we get to come and be your people. God, I just pray that you will speak through me this morning, that you help me to get out of the way. God, help your word to speak truth into our life about how to to function in a world that hurts us. God, help us to live in light of that truth. Help us to leave here today looking more like you. We love you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, here we go. You may be seated. Thank you. I was told I was not allowed to say rest your rumps anymore. It's okay. There's four keys that we're going to look at in our passage this morning to healing the hidden wounds of this life. First one is found in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 1. I'll read it again. It says this. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has cleansed from sin. The first principle we have to learn in order to heal from the hidden wounds in our life, and everyone just say, oh, Pastor Dan, I don't like that. Come on, say it. Oh, Pastor Dan, I don't like this. You don't even know what it is yet, but it is. The first thing we have to do is this. We have to forgive the offender. Right? We have Easter coming very soon, this month. Is everybody excited? I'm getting excited. I've never preached on Easter before. It's gonna be fun. So, just around the corner, we start to begin about thinking about Easter and we think about Jesus' earthly life and his ministry here and our focus and our hearts start to come to the Passion Week, right? When Jesus, it starts with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem and all the people gathered on Palm Sunday morning shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. If I could try and travel, that might be one of the places that I would go. And then you look just a few days later at the stark contrast of the scene. That same crowd chanting, crucify him, give us Barabbas. 
And don't you start to think that that might have caused a wound internally. The suffering that Jesus experienced for us was not merely physical. Not just the scourging, not just the crown of thorns, not just the physical exhaustion of carrying his own cross, the shame of nakedness, or the excruciating torment of being pierced, hoisted up, and dropped into a hole. No, it was more. It was the internal wounds of watching his closest friends scatter and desert him, deny him, and betray him. The wound of, for the first time in his life, bearing the fullness of sin and God's holy wrath. The wound of God the Father turning his face away. And to think that in the midst of that suffering, in the hurt, the isolation, the rejection, Christ had this mindset. We see it in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. It's in your outline. It says this, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is while they were casting lots for his clothes. The mindset we're supposed to have is his. I haven't gone through that. But we remember the context, right? The people that Peter is writing to, right, are people that are being persecuted, killed, lit on fire, losing family and community status. And to him he says, let your attitude be that of Christ. It needs to be the same exact attitude that Jesus has. And the problem we run into, my friends, is deep down in my heart, I don't really want to forgive them. Anybody else? No, just, just me? Right? And I get that. But how's that working out for you? The answer is it isn't because forgiveness isn't for them. It's for you. Forgiveness is for you to be able to walk away from it and be okay. So I got a couple of reasons why we should forgive people who hurt us. This is in your outline. First one is this, because God's already forgiven you. We all love God's grace, right? Reality is we're told by his word that we need to give it out. Number two is this, you're going to need forgiveness in the future. Right? You never want to burn a bridge that you have to walk back over. Think about the Lord's Prayer. What does Jesus teach us to pray? Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Translation, God, I want you to forgive me this exact same way that I forgive others who offend me. Do you want to pray that prayer? Anybody down for a one-for-one -one exchange on forgiveness? I'd be in the negative. Anybody else? General James Edward Oglethorpe. Anybody ever heard of him? The founder of the colony that we now call the state of Georgia. General Oglethorpe one time came to a pastor in his day, a pastor named uh, John Wesley, 1700s, and he said to him this, I never forgive, and I never forget. To which Wesley replied, then, sir, I hope you never sin. And he walked away, <laughs> like gangster mode. Um, <laughs> the younger side got that. You guys, I love you. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about memes in another Bible study another time. You're never going to stop hurting until you learn to forgive. That's your next fill in the blank. Hebrews 12, 15 says this. See to it. That means watch out. That no one fails to obtain the grace of God. That no root of bitterness, you know, roots being subterranean, meaning under the ground, they can't be seen. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes you trouble. And by it, 
many become defiled, meaning that they get hurt. They either hurt someone else or they hurt themselves. And I'll tell you just a quick story about bitterness. When I was a college kid, the tech world was awesome, and we had something called an iPod, okay? It was the coolest invention ever. You could take all your records and your CDs and your cassette tapes and slam them all onto this little device and take it with you wherever you went. Well, my brother came home from the military, and he had an iPod video that was better than my iPod, so he gave it to me. He didn't need it anymore. This was like an iPod, but it could play videos, so it was super cool. But my old iPod was just sitting in my car, not getting used. And a friend from church looked at me, and this, this iPod was worth about 100 bucks. said, hey, are you doing anything, anything with that iPod? Can I, can I buy it from you? And I was like, sure. How about 50 bucks? I'll give it to you for half price. It's totally, totally, just because I love you. And he said, sweet, I'll bring you the money next week. And then he took it. And so next week I get to church and I just expect him to like walk up, be like, hey, thanks for the iPod and to give me the money and nothing. Two, three, four, six weeks later, I just keep expecting him to be good to his word and nothing. And it got to the point where I was watching him like a hawk. Because I asked him, like, hey, man, eventually I got, I got to the point where I, I asked him, I said, hey, do you have the money or do you want to just give the iPod back because, you know, I don't want to be upset with you. He's like, no, I'll get it to you next week. I, I have to wait till payday. But then we'd go to Leatherby's after college group, and he had plenty of money for that. Or it would be Saturday night and the new Star Wars movie was out or something, and we'd all go, and he had money for that. And all of a sudden, I could feel my heart just get bitter and upset to the point that I was the one in the wrong. And I was convicted to go to him and just say, hey man, it's yours. I'm carrying this burden around and I can't anymore and I will never bring it up to you again. I am sorry for the way that I've treated you. I had to personally choose to forgive him. More for myself than for him. Anybody ever cut you off on the road before? Right? You're sitting back there angry. They're just bopping to Caleb. They don't even know they offended you. I had to forgive him for me. I had to check the root of bitterness that I felt every time I saw him or heard what he was doing. Because it was unhealthy the negative emotions, if you don't surrender to them, they spill into other aspects of your life. I had to be willing to say, hey, Lord, this one's yours. You do you. So that when the enemy came along and wanted to be like, hey, Dan, hey, Dan, have you thought about, I'm not going to tell you his name because I don't want you guys to be mean to him, but he's not here. He's not here. We're good. He's not there either. So um, when the enemy would come along and be like, hey, he's doing this, I could just look at him and say, hey, go bother someone else. I gave that to God. First Peter 4, 2 says this, so as to live for the rest of our time in the flesh, meaning the rest of your life, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. The second key to overcoming wounds from this life is to focus on God. So in other words, my friends, it's not about you. It's not about me. You don't know what's going to go on in the future. There may be more hurt and more persecution, more wounds. For the people Peter was writing to, their persecution, this trial we've been talking about, went on for another 300 years. But you have to make that choice that you're not going to focus on the hurt or the pain, but rather focus on the healer. You're going to have to begin to focus on God and make that choice that, you know, it's 
where you're going to go to mentally and emotionally, that you're no longer going to live that way of bitterness, the way of human passions, the way of the flesh. You have to learn to turn a negative into a positive, right? How do you turn a negative into a positive? The vertical line. And it's kind of like a word picture, right? It could be a cross for Christ or T for trust in Christ, whatever it is that you need it to be. We have to start to begin to paint that visual in our minds that we're going to trust God regardless of what happens, regardless of what does or doesn't take place with that person that hurt us. We don't like that, do we? We'll talk about that in a minute. 1 Peter 2, 23, in your outline, puts it this way. That he, that's Jesus, was reviled, meaning to suffer inside and out. Yet he did not revile or seek to cause suffering in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Jesus didn't threaten to get even, right? He left it in God's hands, who always judges justly. Meaning he wasn't going to live his life like some of us do, wondering, you know, how can I get even with that guy and make him suffer the way that he made me suffer? No. He said, God's going to take care. And we have to say, God's going to take care of it. He's God, I'm not, and I'm going to trust him to do that. What ends up happening as people who live with pain in our lives, subconsciously we have this belief in the back of our minds that if I forget about it, if I let go of the pain, it means that that person gets off scot-free. And that's just not the case. You can hold on to it. You can store it away like we talked about a couple weeks ago in your color-corded, alphabetized, time-stamped file cabinet and retrieve it every time you want to be bitter. But how's that going for you? It's not going well. Or you can trust it to God. You can put it in his hands and allow him to do what he is going to do. Right? Right? Now, what you don't want to do is say, okay, God, you're in control now, but here's what I think that you should do to that person. I got some suggestions for you, right? That's probably not the right heart attitude. You must be willing to say this. God, whatever it is that you want to do, that's between you and them. It's none of my business. Look with me at Psalms 56, 8. It says this, you have kept count of my tossings. That means you know how troubled I am. I can't sleep. You put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? God has a record of your tears. Have you ever thought about that? You don't have to remember the pain. God does it for you. God remembers your pain. He understands the hurt, so you don't have to rehearse it over and over. You have to make the choice to pivot and focus on God. Romans 15, 13 says it this way. And this one's a keeper. You may want to memorize it, write it down, highlight it. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. In in believing, meaning you must trust him so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by my strength, you may abound in hope. May the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So if you're interested in having hope, peace, joy in life, It says that you have to believe in him, to look to him, to trust him, allowing him, right, allowing the Holy Spirit to give us the abounding hope. Abounding hope sounds like a cool band name. 
we're abounding hope. If you don't want that, here's what you're going to get, the opposites. Instead of God-given hope, hopelessness. Instead of joy, sorrow. And without the Prince of Peace reigning in your life, there will only be warring in your heart. The Good News translation of the Bible takes apart some of the harder books like Job and puts it into modern English for us. And there's, in Job chapter 11, this is in your outline, verse 13, 15, and 16, right? It says some things to Job. It says this, put your heart right and reach out to God. Then face the world again, firm and courageous. Then all your troubles will fade from your memory like floods that are past and remembered no more. The third thing we have to do to overcome the wounds of this life is face the future. We, gotta, we can't just keep looking at the past. We have to face the future. The truth is telling us that if we are able to set our focus, right, on the healer, if we can lock our attention on Jesus, then the memories that we have will begin to fade away. Not to say that they're not going to sneak back in because the enemy will do that. His goal is to kill, steal, and destroy. If he wants to steal joy from you, he's going to remind you of a crummy experience that you've had. So you have to make sure, and we have to make sure, that we're aware of that in our lives. Always being on guard, not focused on the past, but moving forward. And you might be saying, hey, Pastor Dan, do I forget all my past experiences and hurts? You can't. You can't unsee what you've seen. You can't unfeel what you've filled, felt. You can't remove it. It's a memory that's etched in your brain. But church, there's a difference between mourning and moaning, okay? Mourning is saying, Lord, this happened, and it really sucks. Moaning is saying, Lord, this has happened, and I'm never going to get over it. So you have a choice. You can choose to face the, fu the future mourning. I can't, it sounds like I'm saying mourning like good morning, but you know what I mean. And saying, God, this situation's hard, but by your power, you're going to allow me to get over it. Or moaning and saying you're never going to be able to get out of it. And just continuing to sit in that situation, in the pain and in the hurt. Psalms 34, 17 says, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. He doesn't just leave us where we are. See, the key to forgetting is refocusing. If you have time, you may want to try this. If, if, if you try to convince yourself to forget something, anybody ever tried this before? Right? And you start to say, you know, I'm never going to remember that. I don't want to remember that. I'm not going to replay it. I'm not going to dwell on it or think about it. I don't want to. What are you doing? You're just focusing on it. So what do you need to do? You need to replace it. Replace it with something else. And as Christians, what do we replace it with? Remember? Yes. We replace it with the hope that we have, the joy and peace in believing we focus on God the author and perfecter of our faith. Peter goes on to show us, as it says in your outline, that we as Christians don't mask your pain with a quick fix. 1 Peter 4, 3 says it this way, for the time that is past suffices. That means in the past you wasted too much time doing what Gentiles want to do, what non-believers enjoy. Living in the sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking, and parties, the lawless idolatry. In other words, you've had hurts in your life, 
and you've tried to see if you could drink them out. You thought, I'm just going to drown my sorrows. Problem is, you wake up in the morning, you're hungover, and your sorrows are still there. The problems have not gone anywhere. Maybe you feel abandoned. And at some point, you thought, I'm just going to go hook up with someone to fill that hole. Problem is, sooner or later, you're going to be alone again, and it isn't a solution. Peter's asking them and us, why would you do that? There are three problems with the painkillers that the world offers us. First one is this, they don't last. They only last as long as you're high, as long as you're masking it, as long as you're doing whatever it is that you're doing. And for you, it may not be drugs, alcohol, or sex. Maybe you're a workaholic. And you have the same wounds, worries, and concerns, and you're masking them with a sense of control because at least you're doing something. Hitting a little close to home? We're going to pass the wireless mic around right now, and everybody's going to confess no, right? We all have one. Maybe it's sports. Maybe it's doom scrolling on social media for far too many hours. Maybe it's video games. You guys in the back over there. Um, crafting, right? Ouch, but Pastor Dan, those are not bad things. I love my cricket. I know, I have one too. But they can become idols that we go to instead of going to the one who can truly bring us peace. Number two is this, they can become addicting, and it is a sad truth, my friends. Not just about the above vices, but I've known people through high school and college that have never touched any drugs, have never taken a sip of liquor from their parents' secret stash, right, who all of a sudden end up hurt in a sports accident or a work-related injury or some kind of emotional thing and they get addicted to the legal drugs prescribed to them by their doctor. And then when the prescription runs out, they go on the hustle because they're dependent upon them. So we need to be careful. Drugs are important tools, but they are also very powerful and can be easily abused. I don't have time, but I've never done drugs but when I had my gallbladder out a year and a couple months ago, for the first time in my life, I was given like those kind of drugs and I realized really quickly why people like them. And I'm real thankful that I don't have access. <laughs> Third one is this, they never solve the problem. Right, at the end of the day, you still have the problem. You're just masking it and not addressing it. Genesis 2.18 says this, this is for our last point. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Number four way of how to overcome the wounds of this life is find a support group. Oftentimes this verse is singled out as a marriage verse, but it's more than that. If it was just good for Adam not to be unmarried and a single man, it would have said that. But instead it says it's not good for mankind to be alone. God has created us for companionship and community. Sorry, my introvert friends. Um, but, you know, when we get into that mindset of being alone and isolated for too long, we find ourselves always in a bad spot. Look with me at James chapter 5, verse 16. I put it in here just because I know it makes a lot of believers uncomfortable. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Okay, everybody turn to your neighbor and tell them your favorite sin. <laughs> I'll wait. We got time. <laughs> Reality is that the blood of Jesus covers all of our sins, past, present, future. That's why we as Christians do not go and have to confess our sins to a priest. We have a perfect high priest, Peter says, in Christ Jesus. 
but we are supposed to confess, meaning share with others that we trust so that they can keep us accountable and growing that we might be healed. You need to have your battle buddy or your accountability group. We're not meant to do it alone. Amen? No? Okay. I know I'm going longer than normal, guys, but you got to stick with me. We're almost done. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift them up. But woe to him who is alone or when he falls and has no one else to lift him up. The remaining verses are just for you guys to pray and think about this week. Hebrews 10, 25, not neglecting meeting together. I mean, coming together as Christians, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Or 1 Peter 4.10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. As each one of you has a special ability given to you by God. Be sure to use them for each other, right? Not for us, but for each other. I have one more verse for you because maybe you're the one coming here today who feels beat up and bruised. Like I said at the beginning, I, I'm sorry. But that's a hard place to be. And I don't want to leave here without acknowledging that. When we're talking about suffering, for some of us, it's really real right now. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says this. Come to me, all who labor and who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, you don't have to carry that burden, my friend. I'll do it for you. You don't have to bear the weight of your own mistakes and your own sin and your own regrets. I'll do that for you. Aren't you glad we have a high priest like him? Me too. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much today for your word. Lord, I am so thankful that you don't leave us where we are. God, but that you help us to grow, that you help us to heal and mend on the inside. God, we just want to come before you and be honest that there are wounds in this life that we're still holding on to, that we need to give to you and let you be God over Lord, before we leave here today, I pray that you will allow our hearts to just lay them at your feet. Because you can handle them and we can't. Jesus, help us to leave here today looking more like you. In all we say, in all we think, and in all we do. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never taken that step to ask this Jesus guy for a relationship, I just want to offer you the opportunity right now. If you would like him to be your Lord and Savior, I'd ask you to pray this prayer with me. And it's just simple. It's this, Lord Jesus, today I admit that I'm a sinner, that I've missed the mark. And Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, that you died on the cross and that you rose again. Lord, today I confess you to be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a brand new creation in Christ. I love you, Jesus. Amen.